Come on, I know you're out there. Give us the thumbs up. Come out, come out wherever you are. Well, if you check out our uh, YouTube video, you can see Foster singing on a little teapot. There we go. We got one, and one is not the loneliest number because we're going to go ahead and start. Good morning. I'm Bruce. I'll be doing camera work and the idiotic narration, and we'd like to welcome you to another session of Facebook Live and the Art of Fire, glass blowing. And today, it's going to be holes in glass. And the idea of being poking holes and also making windows and stuff. Good morning, Jennifer. Glad to see you there. Hello, everybody. Let us know you're here. Remember that if you comment, you get entered in the drawing for free pieces. And uh, we'll cover that in just a moment. So today, what we're going to have for you. Good morning, Joanna. Nice to have you with us. And Jen and Kimberly. Hello from Florida. I bet it's warm down there. Sharon, good morning. Okay. All right, here we go with uh, our program today. We're going to have a gazing ball. Todd's going to make that for us. Hello, Steve. And then we'll have a pitcher with a hole for a handle. And we'll have a vase with loops, as it's called. I'll explain that in a minute. And then a window vase. So this is all centered around the idea of either poking holes in the glass, and we'll explain that process as we go along, or creating windows to observe the glass through the outside to the inside. So uh, before we get started, though, let's go ahead and cover this business of the giveaways. All right. Uh, Isolene Sanderson won this beautiful paperweight last week from last week for commenting. And next week's giveaway is this uh, unusual ornament here with a really neat bubble pattern on it. We'll show you the mold that's made from in just a few moments. Another thing we'd like to emphasize this week, and we'll come back to it a couple times, is another fundraiser. Some of you may recall that a few months ago we had a fundraiser for the charity No Kids Hungry, and we each made uh, drinking glasses of different shapes, and you ordered those, and we contributed $2,200 to the charity. So we can uh, carry that a little further this time, and it's going to be Cats for Kids. And these will be the cats. So I'll turn that around a little bit so you can get a view of it. And Todd has selected a series of colors in here. We call them the Maryland colors. They're basically the colors that you find in the Maryland state flag. And also because we're associated with the Maryland Renaissance Fair for, what, 37 years, Foster? 37 years with Maryland Renaissance? 47, yes. Okay, so... Anyway, those are the color choices. The cats will be $60 each. Half of that goes to charity. With That's a, a U.S. dollar price, and shipping is included within the U.S. International shipping would be a little bit more. Okay, good morning, David Hogan. Glad to have you with us. Lindsay and Kristen, great to see you, too. All right, so now let's talk about holes in glass. Okay? So we can do a lot of different things with this. For instance, here is a simple ornament at... Uh, Quite often people are interested in having, instead of a round ornament, a flattened one, one that we can show on edge. Well, in this particular case, we've got a hole right in the middle of it. We can take that another step further and create vases that are made with holes in the circular stem, okay? So that's one other application. We can poke holes up and down through the piece like this and leave them open. So you can actually stick finger in it, okay? Or we can create holes that we can, oh, here's another one that we can look at that we can actually put our hand through and pick up. That's the picture. But sometimes we can create the holes that just have the space there and then make a window in the glass. The gazing balls are these here. They don't actually have hook holes. This is done by using frit that expands after uh, heating, and we use a diamond optic mold. So, lots of stuff. Yeah, we're really sorry if there's something with the feed over here. Sometimes we have a little bit of trouble broadcasting from that spot in the studio. If it keeps up, we'll uh, we'll see if we have to make any adjustments. We took the Wi-Fi off. 
Yeah. Yeah. So okay. So Todd, you're going. Yeah, a couple people are saying it's bouncing. You're going to make a gazing ball, huh? Yes. Okie doke. What card? Uh, we're going to do a uh, jade green. We're going to do uh, um, actually we've got three different colors. We're going to do like making an Easter egg. So that's what it makes me think of. We're okay. going to go with white, then green, and then an iris gold. These are all powers. We're going to use what we call it. The uh, diamond knuckle, which are down here, you can see they've got different sizes, different cups, but the pattern is essentially the same. It's going to be kind of tough to see. But there are little pyramid shaped points within these cups, and these are uh, cast out of bronze. But those points, when the glass press, presses against, will make a little uh, uh, quadrahedral. God knows, man. It's like a, a half of a rhomboid or something. But we have these little precise indentations. Then we can case over that with another layer of glass. Where those points have pushed in, they will uh, leave space, and there'll be uh, bubbles on top of that. So we'll be able to see what we got. Actually, if you've seen the movie Dune, it's looked like looking down the mountain, a big worm. <laughs> what, the planet, what, Araxis? Oh, what, what is it? I wonder what, wasn't it Araxis? I'm not sure. The only For thing Dune? I know about that is there's a new version of that movie coming out with uh, Timothy Shalamala, whatever they name is. That's how old I am. Okay. Dave Batista. It looks really good. Okay. No, I think Planet Araxis, that was Star, Star Trippers. Okay. All right. All right. So Todd's going to take his first gather of clear glass. For those of you that uh, haven't been around with us before, audio is very jumpy. I haven't had that much coffee this morning, so I don't think it's me. At any rate, bear with us and we'll see what's going. The audio isn't matching up to the video right now. Maybe we should take that uh, Wi-Fi off. Hold on, I'll try to make it. Help. All right. All right. Now, Arrakis. Okay. <laughs> What's an arachnid? No, that would be spider. That would be spider, right. What's arachnophobia? Ah, there we go. Okay. Okay, so we had a little bit of trouble here with the Wi-Fi for the uh, presentation. We'll see if we can get everybody back. Yep, we, uh, we punched the wrong button, and that's why you got dropped for a moment. But hopefully we're back, freezing a bit. Actually, we're getting up into the 40s today, I think. But thanks for asking. I'm kidding, Joanna. Yeah. <laughs> we've, had, we've had a lot of snow and ice around here for a while. Okay. And we're knocking tools all over the place. Okay, here we go. These are the frits here. Todd will be gathering frit on the hot get. Joanna says, now it's better. Okay, we fixed it. Sounds a bit better now. Oh, well, we'd like it a whole lot better, but hey, we'll take what we get. Okay, so Todd now has the green on there, correct? Yes. And he's now picking up the gold. And what we'll see as he goes through this process is after he's gathered all the frit he wants and applies a great deal of heat to it, the frits will start spreading apart and the colors that are down toward the clear glass, the ones he gathered first, they will start to push out and spread things apart. But he's got to get all this frit gathered up first. So like, comment, and share, and bear with us please for uh, our technical difficulties, but hopefully we got this under control right now. When we use the metal table, the marver like this, it's to shape the glass and cool it. Todd's pressurized the air column in the pipe. We'll see that uh, expand a little bit. And now another gentle shaping to bring it back to a more cylindrical shape. We have a lot of different tools we can use for this process. The Marver is really handy. Good morning, Michael Herman. Hey, Michael! Okay. 
Yeah, Todd, we hope we got the technical issues solved. We have little uh, hot zones and cold zones in the studio as far as our uh, coverage being able to connect. Okay, and uh, all right, Iceland, good to see you, and you won the paperweight, but I'm assuming you might have already known that if you looked on the website. But uh, anyway, she won the paperweight from last week, folks, and those of you who comment will be able to win, uh, enter in the drawing to win a beautiful ornament. We'll go back over that in a minute. And Joanna says it's good now. So if it's good all the way to the UK, I'd say it's good across the continental US. All right, so Todd's got the glass heated up right now. He's going into the diamond optic mold. He's going to blow real hard, then he's going to suck in on it so it comes out. And now you can see the impressions in the glass. And that's created by all those points. All those points are the low spots around that. The glass expands. And he has to draw in the breath on it a little bit so that it will release because those are undercut. And if we just pulled straight up on it, we'd have a mess on our hands. Now it's going to be a matter of let it cool a little bit so we can do a subsequent gather. I see Theta is soliciting ideas for St. Patrick's Day, so sure, jump on in there. Beer. Beer, yeah. We'll do a green beer, beer mug. So there you can see, the, no, just the beer. Oh, okay. There's the patterns. You want to slow it down just a tad, Todd. Thank you very much. Okay, great. So he's got to let this cool off because we don't want it getting distorted when he puts it in that 2,000 degree glass to gather. This is the point where he'll trap the bubbles. Each of those low spots, the kind of diamond-shaped impression in there, will trap a little bit of air, which will become a bubble. Shamrocks, that's a great idea, Jen. Okay, so once he's got that done, he'll take a gather of glass out of the furnace. Again, for those of you that uh, may have joined us, haven't seen these before, this furnace holds about 400 pounds of molten clear glass. The furnace runs all year long, every day, unless we take it down for maintenance. Right now he's letting some of the glass drizzle off back into the furnace. That's a real handy way of recycling it really early in the process. And he'll use his diamond shears to pull a little bit of glass off the tip. Okay, so now he's got that all done. He's going to apply heat. He's going to want to start equalizing the temperature. So you recall, he let the core cool off significantly before he gathered. Now he wants to equalize the temperature from the inside moving outward so that he's able to work the glass. So the bubbles are trapped in there now. They're established as part of the, uh, the piece right now. And it's off for a little marvering. You can see that he has the pipe handle pointed downward back there that got him to cover the make a cone, conical shape coming off the pipe, and now he's got one on the end. He's going to blow trap air, and as it stabilizes and cools, we get in a little closer. Beautiful. There's a shot of the bubble strap. Don't want to get the uh, camera too close. We learned a long time ago that uh, cell phones don't like being overheated. And with a 2,000 or 1,800 degree glass, whatever the temperature happens to be, it's sometimes a little bit difficult. But we've actually got a little cooling gel strip on the back so we can get in closer and give you a better shot. At the bench now, Todd will take this shape. He'll cut a jack line in it. The jacks are the two blades attached by a hinge and that cuts a notch or restriction just off the end of the blowing iron and this will allow him to break it free of that. He's using the back of the jacks to cool the bottom. That saved him a trip over to the marver. If he'd have gone over to the marver to cool the bottom, it would have taken too long. And all that blowing now, and you can really see the bubbles starting to show up in all those little depressions that were created by the diamond mold. 
He's checking the caliper size because he'd like to have a consistent size. Is this one an order, Todd, or are we just making it? It is an order, okay? So I won't say that you can have this one, folks, but if you would like to have one, by all means, contact us, artofire.com, or call at 301-253-6642, and you can order your own. We'll take a shot of them in the display area in just a moment. By holding the iron horizontal or even up a little bit, Todd ensures that he has a spherical shape. When we blow and the glass is nice and hot and we hold it horizontally, it expands into a sphere. If we were to hang the glass down, it would stretch out into an elongated shape. If we were to point it up toward the ceiling, it would collapse back toward itself. So, when Todd has the size and shape that he wants, he'll get ready to put a hook on it. The pattern is absolutely stunning, Joanna. It really is. Good morning, Antoinette. Glad to have you with us and Sharon, too. So, check in, folks. Let us know where you are, what part of the world you're watching from, and how things are in your part of the world today. So, now what he's going to do... He's not going to cut that. He's simply chilling it so that it will fracture right there at the blowing iron. He'll place it face down into the holder there and a little tap. And it comes off. Okay, so now he'll take another iron, a small one, and gather a little bit of glass. And we're going to get in for a close look at these bubbles on the gazing ball. And there you go. Janice from Watertown. Great. Holland. Yes, Rude. Yes, indeed. You and Michael over there, huh? Okay. And your wife. I remember you said your wife is on with us today. Okay, so he's going to take this and put a little bit of glass on there. And that's going to form the stem. I'm not sorry, the stem. Thinking about two different things at once. My apologies. All right, so he's got the hook on there. He'll curl the glass over and then use a special tool that allows him to go in there, grab it by the book, and put it in the annealer. Hey, Patrick Foley, good to see you. And Sharon, you're from East Burn, New York. Very good. And there, folks, is the finished product, and into the annealer it goes. For those of you that may not have joined us before, the annealing is the longest process in our glass making, and it takes about... Uh, eight hours to anneal the glass. So let's hear it for Todd. How about some hearts and flowers and thumbs up and all that good stuff. All right, let's go take a look at the display thing. So now that you've seen it made, we'll show you one that's like the final product. All right, here we go with a couple of the gazing balls. And when the frits spread apart and you got those bubbles in there, that's how we got the windows into the glass, okay? So these were windows that were created without having to poke a hole in the glass. But for the rest of what we're doing today, we're going to be poking holes in glass. Okay? So, uh, I still won. This is the uh, uh, paperweight that you won for commenting. Any of the rest of you could comment today and win this beautiful ornament back here. And again, I'd like to tell you about a special charity event that we're uh, sponsoring right now. And this is going to be Cats for Kids. And it's going to be these cats in what we call the Maryland colors. After our long association with the Maryland Renaissance Festival and also being here in Maryland, it seems appropriate. They'll be $60 each, half of which will go to the charity. No kids hungry. Uh, shipping is included in the U.S. International shipping would be a little higher. It'll be a limited edition, and they're only available in the month of March. After that, they will be no more. They'll be signed and numbered. So there you go if you want to do something for a charity. So now we can move on to poking holes in glass. So what we're going to do next is a pitcher with a hole for a handle. Okay, so that's coming up next. Here are some other examples of pieces that have holes in them. So here's a piece with holes poked in the side. And yes, they go straight on through. And uh, thank you, Michael. We have some vases here with uh, like donut hole stems. And we can eat. Somebody mentioned earlier they were craving donuts. Here's a perfect ornament with one with a hole poked through it. So uh, 
Josh is going to be making this for us. And off we go with poking holes. Okay. Hello, my brother. That's for Michael. He knows. That's for Michael. Okay. What color you got there, Josh? Cobalt blue. Cobalt blue. If you can't make it big, make it blue. Make it big and blue. Yep, okay. When you can't make it big and blue, you poke the hole in it. Yeah. And then and then you get the trifecta, right? Big blue and a hole poked in it. Okay. So, Josh has got the cobalt blue on the end of the pipe. It'll melt in. He'll take it over to the marver, or perhaps he might use the bench in the back of his jacks to shape it a little bit, and then put a very little bit of air into it. Yes, Antoinette, it is a soft color. That doesn't make it any easier to poke through, though, because he's going to be gathering enough clear over it. So uh, there he is on the barber, rolling it out, so I'm just getting a nice uniform shape. Will it be crackled? It's not going to be crackled, but we are going to go through some baking soda water. Ah, okay. So, there won't be crackles, but there'll be bubbles, okay? So, I guess bubbles are part of our theme today. And what we've got over here is a bowl that has baking soda in the water, and that'll get mixed up so it's not all sitting on the bottom of the pan. And in just a little bit, Josh will be running the glass into that bowl, and the baking soda will coat the surface. And then, when he takes another gather of clear glass over top of that, it'll create bubbles. So right now, he's got his first gather of clear glass. Uh, let's see. Kathleen, Kathleen McClendick is asking, can you show his Susan Haas piece with a baking soda stripe during a break? I'm not sure. Maybe Josh knows where the piece is. We'll yeah, see about it. It's up front. It's up front? Yeah, okay. We'll see about the... that. Okay. So now he's got that first gather of clear glass. And by pressurizing the air in the pipe, you'll see the central core of that expand. And the cobalt blue fills more of the gather. Suzanne Himmelberg says it's an interesting technique. What about if you added vinegar to the baking soda? Smaller bubbles? I don't know, but uh, baking soda and vinegar, I found out, is the perfect way to uh, clean off my soup pots when I burned food into them. So I don't want to clean the bubbles off of the thing. There we go. You can see a little bit of crackling or scarring on the surface. That's the baking soda in the water. Now this gather, it'll interact with the baking soda. The baking soda will cause bubbles to form, and we'll see those as Josh comes back. It's a little bit bright right now because of the heat of the glass, but in just a moment after he blocks, it'll become more evident because the glass will cool off. Still got quite a glow to it, but we'll see. You can see it right at the pipe right there. The end of it's still very, very hot. As the glass cools off and the incandescence disappears a little bit on the video, you should be able to see it. But we're not going to ask Josh to interrupt the process and let this cool completely. We'll get a better view of it as we move along. So now those bubbles are trapped in there and they will remain. Anita, we would love to have you visit when it's safe to do so. And you can do that simply by calling the studio. Uh, we're at 301-253-6642. And when it's safe to arrange it, we'd love to have we'd love to have all of you show up. Not necessarily at the same time, but we'd love to have all of you here. Okay, Josh is using the cherry wood block to shape the glass. It cools the outside a little bit, and now he's simply blowing in. He did not trap and pressurize the air. He did what we call free-blowing. Just raised the pipe to his mouth and simply blew into it. The jacks will form a point to separate the glass from the blowpipe. 
And now he's going to cool the tip so it doesn't expand excessively when he blows. See that conical shape at the end of the piece? Keep that in mind because when he goes to blow it out, it won't expand there as much as it does elsewhere simply because it was cool. And we all know hot glass moves and cold glass don't. <laughs> Now, a little bit of swinging back and forth. We'll have to back up a little bit to get a good view of this. And now he has elongated the glass to about the size he wants for the pitcher. And as he blows, you'll see that he still has that taper down at the bottom because he cooled it on the bar, reinforcing the jack line. You can see there's a lot of heat in the bottom that's also indicative of a large mass of glass. There's a good bit of solid glass down in the bottom of that. And again, that's because of the uh, cooling on the marver. Foster's going to take a reheat for him now, get it a little bit warm, and then Josh is going to use the cork paddles to flatten the piece. Now, Foster's going to put his finger over the mouthpiece because if he doesn't, and Josh squeezes with the cork paddles, it could actually bring the glass to touch up on itself inside. So, Foster will hang it over the edge, he'll cap the pipe with his finger, and then if Josh wants it uncapped, he'll tell him. So, he draws down on it with the cork paddles, So when Josh says uncap, Foster takes his finger off. And there we have the flattened shape for the pitcher. Okay. Now we're getting ready to poke the hole, and what Josh will do is use this carbide rod to poke the two sides toward each other in the middle of the piece. And you'll notice he's doing it offset to one side. We don't want this hole directly in the middle. We want the hole offset to one side because that's going to be the handle. So. We could cork and marver it flat, but then uh, it's hard to do with two people. And if you're doing it alone, then the capping and uncapping becomes a bit of an issue. It's a matter of pre preferred technique. Right now, Josh is heating up a tungsten pick that's uh, in a pair of vice grip pliers. Tungsten has a really high melting point, and tungsten will not stick to this glass as badly as other. So by taking the tungsten pick and poking in, and notice he still has the flame right up on that, and he'll work from both sides until he goes through. Tungsten with a high melting point and being such a hard and heavy substance doesn't stick. Uh, any of you are glass blowers, you probably have recalled occasions where you let your shears or your tweezers rest on the glass a little too long and they got stuck. That's because the steel they're made with doesn't have as high a melting point and they pick up heat and they can actually adhere to the glass. So Josh is going to use that uh, tungsten pick again to kind of ream out the hole. So we'll come from over here and see. Actually, there he goes. You can see the pick through this side. He'll flip it over. And he wants to get a really good hole established. Joy had a cat named Tungsten. That's interesting. So now you can see the flame shooting through the open hole. And this is going to allow Josh now to uh, move to a different tool. Now that the hole's established and he doesn't need to be uh, in contact with the glass quite as long, he can actually go with a pair of tweezers. 
Yes, uh, Barbara, he is using a fair bit of force. The glass itself is not cold, but it's a little bit stiff. Now he's going to use the tweezers. Let's get it from around here. And you can see that he's making a circular motion and he's just reaming it out and enlarging the diameter. If the glass touches up, Suzanne, on the inside, there is no remedy. You can't reach in and separate it. So that's why he kept it uh, separated a little bit at first and used the carbon bar to poke the two sides toward each other. He's putting a little bit of air in it to round it out some, and he'll do that again later. But you'll see now, in addition to rounding, He's expanding it laterally, or actually from top to bottom. This is going to create more space for your fingers to go in and hold the glass pitcher. So he'll work on that a little bit till uh, he gets it going. Once he gets that to the shape he wants, then we'll be concerned with the final any inflation of the piece a little bit more uh, work on the symmetry if it's needed, and it doesn't so far, and flattening the bottom. But you can see how he's elongating that sphere into more of an oval. Good morning, Diana, nice to see you with us. You can see the oval shape, make a really great place to put your hand in there and hold this picture. Was this piece ordered, Josh, do you know? This one has not been ordered or claimed, so any of you uh, watching, you can have this piece, uh, just contact us. You can co use the comments right now to talk to Theta about it. Uh, I'm not sure of the price. They'll let us know what that is. Josh is blowing just a little bit right now. That gave it a little more body through all that process. And another interesting thing here you'll see as he turns slowly for us, maybe, one side is wider than the other. The handle side is a little more narrow, and that started early on with the uh, cork paddles and has continued on through the process. So now he's got the handhold in the middle, and then from here on out, he's just finishing up the pitcher. So he's heating the bottom of the piece right now. You can see that he's got most of it out of the glory hole. He'll heat the end of the piece so that it can be flattened, so that should you order it, it will sit up on your table with no problem. He's going to gently press it onto a marble pad right there, and that helps avoid distorting the sides. When you take a rounded or flattened shape like that and you press hard at the bench, you run the risk of making it bulge too much. And as we get an edge shot of that, you can see that it's all the same diameter going across the bottom. Same width, I shouldn't say diameter, because it's not a sphere. Josh will take a little flash there. Foster's preparing the punty. Again, for those of you that may not have been with us before, the punty is simply a bridge or a way to transfer from one pipe to the other. Foster presents it. Josh attaches when he's ready, and you can see all the trail of bubbles up in there from the uh, baking soda. He'll attach that into the middle, turn it some to make sure he's got it centered like he wants. A little water in that jack line that he made, a tap, and it breaks free, and it's time to start the reheat. So you can see Foster is, uh, has it and it's wiggling around a good bit. That's because the punty joint is still pretty hot. Josh Flash, the whole thing, then work on heating the lip area, the top of the vessel. If we create the bottom half to two thirds of a piece, transfer it to a punty, and finish the top. That is the normal process. When we play Young Frankenstein, we'll show you the Abbey normal process. Okay, so he's going to have to heat that lip up. It was hot, it was cold enough to fracture, so it's going to be a while before it gets uh, hot enough to manipulate. So we'll watch that for a moment and he'll come back. And what type of spout are you doing on this, Josh? I'm doing a 
like a ewer spout. He's going to do a ewer spout, which is one that uh, comes up longer on one side than the other, which will involve a really interesting cut. And it's just like the one we showed you on the uh, display table. So, to start with it nice and round and open enough that the glass doesn't close up when he begins his cutting process. Now he has to get that to just the right temperature. Once it's, if it's too hot I when he cuts, that back, Bruce. You're, you're not. I'm not going to do a spout. On this you're going to do a traditional spout. I'm going to do a traditional. It's too nice on the neck. Okay. I like it. So this is going to be just about like the spout that Foster made on uh, the not YouTube good. demonstration. More, okay, you're going to just uh, use the jack blade to uh, push a spout? Okay, so lots of times we, uh, okay, just have to price up there at 125, so if you want this piece, it can be yours. You can see the handle and the lower half of the picture is already formed. He's got this neck opened up to a really nice diameter. And he'll be using his uh, carbon bar to create the spout. Uh, the sound is going again. Okay, well, we haven't changed anything, so it might be our location within the studio or our signal from the uh, service provider. Okay, so now you can see him using the paddle, which the neck was round, so this is going to flatten those two sides so that the line of the piece is continued. Well, I could say breaking up is hard to do, but that would be a really old song. Sorry, folks, if the uh, audio is not working very well right now. Uh, it'd be just about impossible to figure that out on the fly. So, let's watch the process. Now, by using this torch, he'll spot heat the area that he wants to use to make the spout. And then just a little movement with the carbon bar. He's got his spout going. A little bit more. So you can get a perfect pour. If it distorts the shape of the lip opening, he uses the tweezers to straighten it out. A little drop of water on the funny, off it comes, and away to the annealer. Well, Joy, we're glad you like it, and any of the rest of you that like it, you can purchase that piece. It is not spoken for. Uh, we also have a clear one over here on the display area. And that is our pitcher with a hole for a handle. So there's a sample of it right there. Yeah, let's get those thumbs up and hearts going for Josh. Okay. So, and this also had the bubbles from the uh, baking soda. So you can see that in it. Okay. So there's your gorgeous pitcher at 125. You can order one. You can even order one special to get it in your own colors. Okay. So. Let's go back and see what we've got. We're going to do a vase with loops in just a moment here. We'll show you some more of the display area and talk about a couple things. Maybe it doesn't make a lot of sense to talk about something when the audio is not cooperating, but we really want you to be aware of this. We're once again raising funds for No Kid Hungry. And this time, instead of a series of drinking glasses, we're going to do cats. 
and we're calling this Cats for Kids. They'll only be done during the month of March. They're $60 each. Half of that goes to the charity. That'll include shipping in the U.S. International shipping would be extra. This will be a limited edition. The pieces will be signed and numbered, but we'd really like to get participation in your orders so that we can contribute more money. We raised uh, $2,200 for the charity when you all ordered drinking glasses. We'd like to go toward that again. So that's the main thing we want to promote today. Also, Iceland won this uh, beautiful paperweight right here. And next week's prize is this ornament. I promised you I'd show you the mold it was made from. We'll show you that in just a moment, okay? Uh, our theme today is poking holes in the glass and making windows. So here are pieces that have holes poked in them, much in the same manner as the picture you saw Josh just make. Our next piece, for want of a better name, is a vase with loops. And this particular little vase has these three tubes running down it, and they are created by poking holes in the glass and then stretching the glass out. And Josh will be showing us that right now, so let's go check it out. Thank you, Barbara. We appreciate that. Now, we're more than happy to keep uh, donating the money to charity. And uh, here comes Josh with his first gather. You're using the gold powder again? Yeah. Okay. So this will be the same type of color as he had on the one that's on display. He's gathered the glass up. Okay, and here's our little logo for the Cats for Kids. So if you're interested, can you order the Cats for Charity online? Absolutely, Patty. Glad to do that. In fact, that's probably the best way to do it. You can call the studio, 301-253-6642. Okay, and that way you can order a cat. We'll go show you some more of those in a minute right now. Josh has started a little bit of an air bubble into it. The pressurized air is escaping the blowpipe and out into the hot glass. He'll chill that a little bit more with the block. He needs this to be stable before. Will they all be Maryland themed? Yes, Michelle, they will. Uh, so after 37 years associated with the Maryland Renaissance Fair, and having a uh, studio in Maryland for all these years, first at Savage Mill, and since 1998-99 uh, here uh, outside of Damascus, the Maryland theme seems to be a good idea. And if you're not from Maryland, it's okay. It's still a beautiful pet, and you're helping a good cause. Exactly. And the other thing is we don't often have this Maryland color, so that ensures the limited edition nature of it does it get mass produced? Yeah, this, this is the only time that it'll be mass produced. Okay, Sharon, uh, Theta can take care of an order for you. Probably online might be the easiest, but she's busy bailing me out on the comments here, so she might not be able to do it online right away. If you call 301 253 6642, you can absolutely get a hold of Theta. Uh, if she doesn't answer right away, it's probably because a question came up in the comments and she's answering it because I probably didn't see it. So with this fresh hot glass, Josh is now picking up the frit. This is from a company called uh, Lotes and it's a uh, special, special iris color. So we call this like an iris gold. And it's the same color as we saw on the display piece. Ever made crabs? Uh, no, we've cooked them and eaten them, but uh, I'm sure we can make some crabs too. But uh, those aren't going to be part of the charity event right now. Those will have to come after St. Patrick's Day because we're still trying to figure out what to do for that. All right, Josh has got his color on there. 
So what's neat about this color, it's a reducing color. So Bruce kind of talked about that. So when I go into the block, you kind of see what See the happens. sheen appear. And the reduction is from the oxygen being removed. When we look at flames, say either in the glory hole or perhaps there you can see that bright shiny surface, either in a glory hole or for people that work at the torch, we also we have what we call reduction flames, which are starved for oxygen. And when we put the glass into an environment that's starved for oxygen, if we have the right color, we'll be able to release the oxygen from the color and get that shininess. So you can see him now making a triangular pattern on the marble. A little bit of air in it, and then his next step after those triangular shape is established is he's going to use a special tool to pinch the glass. This will not put the holes in it, but it will create the area for the channels that you see. So he pinches it, and we'll take a view from the other side in just a moment. And he's going to make this deeper and deeper. And this is the area that will form the tubes. Now you can see that sometimes they get a little bit out of line and he'll straighten those out. What he's doing now is spreading the point where the glass touched itself on the inside. Some of you asked, but someone asked about that earlier. No, he did not cap it, Antoinette. So right now he's using the tweezers and the glass is hot enough he's actually poking through over and over. This is going to get the hole established and then he'll concentrate on straightening things up. But the first order of business is to get a hole established so he can stretch it out some. Now another application of heat. And a little bit more work of punching holes in glass. Tons of fun. Okay, so he's got holes established all the way around. Still working on that. Still working on that one a little bit? Yeah. That one's broke through, but not as big. You can see them there. So just as he did with the picture, he's using the tweezers to ream that hole and enlarge the diameter. Eventually, he'll be swinging this out and making it longer, which will stretch things. But uh, I'm anticipating he'll lengthen that opening also a little bit. So let's see what he does. He's got the channels established. So this area where he's poked the holes, the glass is touching on itself on the inside. But the channels are not. The channels are still open. See how he pushes that downward and upward? down and up being in relation to the length of the pipe. This is elongating the hole into more of an oval. So he poked the hole through, he enlarged it and kept it round, and now by pushing on either end. Now you'll see a little bit of inflation here. The central portion of this vase is open. So when he blows, it can expand. The channels are open, so they're like having tubes attached to the side of the vessel. Well, hello, Tricia, from the northeast of England again. Welcome aboard. This is really exciting. We've got folks from Netherlands, uh, England. Uh, we've had people from Germany. It's really pretty cool. Great. Glad to have you with us. All right, so now Josh is getting a lot more heat in this. You can notice he's in the glory hole for a little bit longer. That probably indicates he's going to go for a little bit uh, of enlarging the piece and possibly some blowing. Watch the inflation now. Concentrate on the center area, and you can see that got larger. Also, the bottom did a little bit. And, of course, he needed heat throughout the piece so that he's able to cut the jack line close to the pipe that will allow us to take it off of the pipe later on. 
a little more inflation. You saw the center portion inflate. He's chilling the bottom with the wet newspaper so that it doesn't get a lot larger. We need to keep that cool and a uh, good concentration of thick glass in the bottom so that it doesn't come out when he uh, blows it out some. This one's not spoken for, is it, Josh? Okay, so this one can be purchased also. Again, uh, I'm not sure of a price. Uh, Theta can help you out with that. Okay, the airplane propeller motion has elongated it. And from the blowing that he did before, the diameter increased, but the lengthening brought it back to a nice cylindrical shape. Now he's using the tweezers, since he obviously can't use his fingers to straighten this out. And he's using them just to get a nice straight line and a good spot down at the bottom where the tube joins back up with the piece. See the nice symmetry of it, a little bit of shaping. Okay, so a little more heat in it, a little more manipulation. When he's back to the bench, a little elongation. Very good. These pieces are truly one of a kind. They don't always come out exactly the same. Very close, but this one's a lot longer than the one that's on the display table. You can see him lifting a little bit as he shapes that bottom. And also, that motion toward the, uh, on the bottom of that tube helps him get those aligned. And now as we look at it from the end, you can see that all of those columns are nice straight lines. Now he's going to work on heating primarily the bottom, and Foster's going to bring him a cheater. We have color on the outside of this, the frit. Okay. If we put a putty directly onto the frit, when we take the putty off, quite often we lose some of the frit on the outside of the glass. It just sticks to the putty and comes off. So by Foster bringing over a little bit of glass, Josh will grip the pipe with his jacks, place it in the center, peel it off, and then he'll start to flatten that. This button or cheater bit will not be visible on the finished piece. It'll be on the bottom, but it allows us the security of knowing that we won't be pulling the frit off. Josh is going to paddle the bottom flat. No, you can't stick it. He'll probably take another flash in a moment, and then they'll do the transfer. The little dimple in the bottom. Yes, Suzanne, the three arms are open to the bottom. So if someone were putting flowers in it, in water, water could become trapped. However, it should all drain out. They are not closed at the bottom. Okay, Josh is going to do a little bit more alignment just to make sure he's got the straight lines and the curvature. Here comes Foster with the punty. We'll watch the attachment and the centering. By putting the tweezer blades onto the pipe as he turns in a moment, he gets it dead center. The punty iron does not bob up and down. A couple drops of water and a tap, and off it comes. So, once again, we've finished up the bottom two-thirds of the vessel, and now it's going to be heat the top to the point that it can be worked, and Josh will do that. Josh will take the iron from Foster once things stabilize a little bit. We don't want to have a handoff there when the piece is bobbing up and down because it's on a really hot putty. So, that neck area was cold enough to fracture. It's going to take a few moments to reheat and get it malleable to work. How hard is it to learn how to make a bottom that isn't crooked? 
Uh, I don't know. That depends on the student. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, the way we teach it, we are at a pretty good uh, position when you do flatten it. We teach a way to get things aligned and push the glass to the center. And also, the glass blower's posture at the bench helps them get better perspective. If the glass blower sits far away from the piece, they can't see over the end and tell what they're doing. So you'll notice when we flatten pieces, quite often we lean out a little bit to take a good look. So now you can see the heat concentrated on the top of the piece, where it's bright. Foster's going to offer the paddle. Actually, Josh is going to pinch this and pull it a little bit. So this is going to do a couple of things. It's going to thin the lip area. And it's also going to create a point where he can pull it out. So by cutting a little jack line, it gives him a nice straight shape. And you can see the neck of the vessel elongating a little bit. A second jack line is the break-off point and another reheat. All right, so you're going to pull that a little more, Josh? Yeah, I'll pull it a little bit more. Okay, so by creating that little, we call it a flower shape on the end, and creating a jack line there, Josh can put his jack blades behind that flower, closer to the punty iron, if you will, and then use that as a point of leverage to lengthen it and pull it out. So we should be able to see that happen. He's on the inside right now to chill that, and he'll grab that and he'll start pulling out. And you'll see the length of the lengthening of the neck and it's narrowing. By using the jacks to create that second constriction, that's where it will break off. He'll put a little bit of water right onto that joint. He's going to grab it with the diamond shears. Foster will tap it and off it comes, right at that joint. Okay, great work guys. So, now he's lengthened and thinned the neck and the lip area, so now it's time for his opening. I think I just missed something on the comments about uh, people wondering how, not only how to keep the bottom of a vessel flat, and not tilted, but uh, I had a beginning glass blowing class one time, and we went out to dinner with the students, and some of them were a little upset that they had made drinking vessels that didn't sit level. So I showed them a really nice trick. You take your butter knife and put it under one edge of the drinking glass you've made, and it looks like it's sitting level. That's a good one, Bruce. Okay. So now he's going to go inside the opening with one blade. When he has time or room, he'll get two and start to flare the lip back. See how he's raising the angle of the jacks. He's making a constriction behind it. If the lip of the vessel starts to cave in a little bit, he'll simply use the back of the jacks to pressure it and get it in position. He's looking for his steam cone now. And just as you've seen us use the steam cone before, he'll get the glass hot, insert the cone into the hot glass, the water will evaporate, the resultant steam will inflate the top of the vessel. So that's what we're looking for on his next return to the bench. Remember to share, like, comment. Your comments will get you uh, entered in a drawing for our giveaway piece this week. And if you'll share, we get more viewership, and we would really love that. So now, into that constricted area with the steam cone, and watch the vessel inflate right before your very eyes. Okay, so that's how he gets that to bulge out now. Foster and Josh team up on the lip area a little bit, and now it's simply a matter of deciding buttering up your students. Yeah, that's a good one, David. Actually, when we teach a week-long class, we do get them to flatten their vessels completely. But uh, it was kind of fun to take some crooked uh, cups to dinner and 
hold them up with a butter knife. All right, so now a little bit more shaping on the lip. See how Josh brought his arm up high now? He's on the back side of that and he's leaning against the lip a little bit for a little bit of paper. And you can see how everything just pulled into shape so nicely. A little more steaming right there to bring the shoulders up to the lip. Let's see. Let's try something different that we haven't tried before. What's that? So let's see if we can actually get it to twist. Get it to twist? Okay. Right. So. We can do twisted columns on this, and what Josh will likely do is heat this up. Now, he's got to stop just short of melting or anything like that, but he needs this body flexible enough that as he turns, it twists. So it really is a matter of getting the heat in just the right place. And if the twist distorts the top, he'll still have time to go back and reshape the top. So, there you go. Here's a slow twist coming. He's turning in one direction, clockwise, all right? And he's getting those channels hot enough that they fall with gravity. So he has to slow down, and as he slows, the channels fall toward the floor. If he were to turn fast, they would stay in more alignment. Yeah, we don't worry too much about the cleaning of something like this, Suzanne. In fact, lots of times we'll make uh, vessels we consider to be exceptional and put in a small enough hole in the top that nobody's gonna be putting anything in our art class. But most of the vases we do absolutely do accept flowers. So now from the end on, you can see the beautiful twist pattern in it. You can also see that it did not twist at the foot. That's because of his placement of the heat. Yes, we do have a second section joy in the gallery. Okay, so you notice his rotational speed was a little bit faster there. He's got most of the twist he wanted. A little steam cone again now to inflate the top. Watch that bulge out. And it doesn't affect the twisted columns. When he comes out, you're doing a little more? Just straighten the top, I think we're good. Okay. We'll get a good shot of this when he takes his last heat before taking it off. Yeah, I think it really did make it a lot more graceful with the twist, and that was largely due to heat. In fact, it was all due to heat and gravity. So he's getting the top, the throat, if you will, straightened out and centered. There we go. A nice graceful twist all the way throughout the columns, but they did not twist up the triangular shape at the bottom. Okay, okay so now it's going to be time to take it off here in a moment. So we'll let them get to that and put it away. And we'll come back up here and show you the little brother to that. Okay, so this is one we made the other day while we were working on it, okay? So this is the same gold color, all right, but without the twist. It looks uh, a little bit like an hourglass shape on a stand. And those columns, I don't know if we can see down in there or not. Not really, we got columns start up at about this point here. There's an opening and they're blown through to there. So that's what you just saw there, is a, a vase with loops, if you will loops, channels, we're not exactly sure what to call them. And Josh, uh, as he showed you, twisted that up masterfully, and that was completely due to being able to control the heat and using the turning speed, the centrifugal force, and a little bit of gravity. So let's give it up for Josh. How about some hearts, flowers, thumbs up, the whole bit. It absolutely is beautiful, and they've got it in the annealer. 
So that's what uh, what we've got there. So this is something special we're doing right now, and I'd like to mention it again. We'll try, probably hit this three or four times during the broadcast. And these are going to be our Cats for Kids in what we call the Maryland Colors. The studio's located in Maryland, has been for many, many years, and after 37 years of the Maryland Renaissance Fair, it really seems appropriate to use these colors. And what we'll do is charge $6 a piece. That's for in the U.S., and shipping's included. Half goes to charity. Uh, if any of our international viewers are interested, there'll be an additional charge for the international shipping, but I know a couple of you have participated in that before, and I don't think it's really an unseemly matter, but you can contact Theta on that. Our winner last week was Iceland Sanderson, won this beautiful marble here, and our piece for next week is this ornament. And you know what? I promised to show you the mold that was made in, so let's take a quick trip back. Josh, would you mind pip picking up the uh, mold that that pink uh, ornament was made in? So, uh, Romero Camarillo makes these for us. He blows glass here. And this one is actually two hemispheres. They're ball bearings that have been welded together. And then the hot glass is inserted into the mold, it's closed up, and the pipe goes down to where the glass goes through, where Foster's finger shows you his finger in there. Then you open it up after you blow, and you get the resultant ornament. So let's go back and take a look at that now, and you'll be able to see. How those ball bearings created these little round or hexagonal uh, indentations in the glass. And you can also see the point where the mold actually comes together here, this seam. All right? And that's one thing you'll always notice about mold blown glass that is fully shaped in a mold, which this is. Okay? So when we make glass freehand, and we're just using the molds for optic or decorative purposes, you won't see those seams in it. But this is a beautiful ornament in its own right, and that's our giveaway piece for next week. So be sure to comment. That's how you'll get entered in the drawing. Today we're poking holes in glass, and we can do something as simple as blowing everybody's diet with a donut. Okay, so this is basically a flattened ornament that had a hole poked in it. We've got some vases that have the same type of thing used as a stem. And here we have pieces that actually have holes all the way, whoop, I'm on the wrong one, holes all the way through them. And we did the pitcher with a hole all the way through it. With the vase with loops, we created the holes, elongated them into the columns, and then made a vase out of it. And the next order of business is to make a vase with windows in it. And here's two samples that we made the other day, and we're going to watch Josh make this right here in a moment. We'll go find out what colors he's using and what the design is. So it looks like he's got a piece of white for the base. What else will you be using in this, Josh? We're going to do a similar pattern to that one that's on the table with the three different color powders, except we're okay. going to use green instead of the blue. Okay. All right. So the use of this sprit is going to be very similar to what you saw Todd do with the gazing ball first off in our video today. And while Josh is reheating that white, we'll take a trip down there and just review that real quick and explain to you what it is you'll see happen with the frit. When we apply the powdered frit, in layers and then reheat it, we can force the glass with the extreme heat to spread apart. And in this case right here, the blue punched through from the lower level as the glass spread apart. This is what Josh is going to make today. In this case, instead of the red, he'll have the green. I think that's what he's saying. We'll find out. So this particular one was made with a layer of blue on the interior closest to the pipe. Then it was covered, I'm sorry, it was white, then white, blue, then white, then red. This actually looks like the blues on the surface. That's because the blue pushed the white and the red apart. 
and the windows will be very similar to what he does down here today. So he's got his white core established. It's hot. We don't always shape the glass on the marble. Sometimes we use a block. And in this case, he's just using a block to shape that uh, chunk of white glass. Okay, so the green is taking the place of the blue. Yeah, the green is taking the place so of the blue. So the green is what will push everything aside. The right. red will be on the outside, the white in the middle. And it'll push it out. And instead of having bubbles, you'll see dots of color pushing out. If you go back later and replay the video and watch Todd's piece, the gazing ball, which was made with the diamond optic mold, it actually the, it was the bubble area that pushed everything out, and it has a clear appearance. Josh is going to get a couple of gathers here because he's going to want plenty of glass on this for a nice sized base. Foster, Rude has, says, says hello. Who does? Rude. Oh, hey. Hey, Rude, how are you, sir? Okay, so back over here at the bench using the cherry wood cup, which we call a block. It's basically a cup on a handle. Ask Rude what's for supper. Ask Rude what's for supper. Yeah, it's getting close to dinner time in, uh, in the Netherlands, huh? Okay, so the cherry wood blocks are kept in these water buckets and that keeps them moist, it keeps them from cracking. And then when they encounter the hot glass, it forms a bed of steam kind of almost like a lubricant to let the glass slide on. Josh has introduced a little bit of pressurized air into it, and now he's increased the size of his gather there. He'll use our pipe cooler over in the edge over there. You can just see it. It's basically an elongated uh, oval bucket with a bar on it to rest the pipe in, and we got a little pump that throws cold water up into it. We'll take a look over there. Actually, he's walking that way. We'll come on over this way. Here's our pipe cooler. So if the iron is getting a little bit warm, we simply lay it down in this trough, not in the area where the glass is, of course, but that'll cool it off enough that we can grip lower on it. Now, you'll see that Josh's hand was down pretty far on the pipe, and with it cooled, he can get this close to the glass without getting burned. It's a significant advantage to have the pipe cooled to that point because it gives you leverage. If the pipe were extremely hot, he would have to grip much further back. It would be harder to control. So by keeping the iron cool enough to touch, we're able to grip closer to the glass and actually manipulate it, the whole thing a lot easier. So now he's got his gather, and it's into the green. This is the base layer. After a few more gathers of frit, you won't be seeing the green until it pops through. So he'll probably do about three gathers on that. He'll use the marver to shape it up some. And before it cools off significantly, he's back in the heat. Rude says they just finished. You ask what's for dinner, they just finished. Okay. All right. So, another dip in the green. Uh, what, three greens, Josh? Three green, greens, two whites, one red. Okay. Also, these uh, irons are made of stainless steel. Stainless steel is not a good conductor of heat. So, by using stainless steel instead of, saying, regular carbon steel for these blowing irons, the iron itself does not get as hot. The glass sticks to it pretty well, and in fact we have to wait longer than people that use just uh, regular steel for pipes for the glass to break off. But that's a small price to pay for having a pipe that you can handle easily. So he's got his three gathers of green, and now he's beginning to get his white. This will be the first gather, and probably by the time he gets this opaque white gathered up, you won't even be able to tell there's green in there.
the use of different metals in the process also uh, applies to our tools. We mentioned earlier that when we poke the holes, we're using a tungsten rod. The tungsten has an extremely high melting point. It's darn near impossible to melt tungsten. And so as a result, and plus it's a very dense or a, a hard metal, and it's very heavy. It's very easy to push it through a piece of glass once it's heated. And you'll be seeing that in just a little bit. We can contrast that though with our uh, diamond shears or tweezers, which are tools that are, are quite often just made from uh, cold steel, not a high carbon steel. And if you're a glass blower, you've probably had the experience of leaving your tool in contact with the glass too long, perhaps while you try to make a cut and the tool sticks to the glass. And that's because of its construction. Okay, so he's got all three layers, green, white, and red. Now we begin the heat, which is going to force the frit apart. The green is gonna to push toward the surface. And more than likely, it'll look as if the green is on top of the red, but it's actually not. Yeah, Joanna, tungsten was used as a filament in light bulbs primarily because of the heat it would withstand and the electric current you could put through it and it would glow like crazy. So, he's getting the heat in, he's taking a look at it. And we're going to start seeing the bubbles pop through. As he cools it a little bit with the block touching that, you'll see a little bit more. And then a couple of reheats will bring him even more to the surface. There, we're getting a little bit of cooling and you can see the green starting to poke through. In just a few moments, it's a powder, Antoinette. All three are powders. And it's this heating process that's pushing them apart. So the more he heats, the more he works this, he's gonna get a really nice design in this. And then before it gets too very large, he'll start poking the holes. Is Josh from Sterling? No, he's not. Uh, Josh is from, uh, well, originally from Baltimore. Lives in PA. I used to live in Sterling but not Sterling, New York, it was Sterling, Virginia. Josh did learn here at the studio. He's taken classes several times at other institutions, but the bulk of his work has been right here and his learning. He probably won't admit it, but I was his teacher in one of the beginning classes. Yeah. <laughs> I think the most memorable thing from that is he wondered what part of the deep south I was from because he never heard such an accent. I swear I thought you were from the you thought, deep south, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm supposed to be like Tennessee or... Yeah, Tennessee. Nope, I'm, Grew up in Prince George's County, Maryland and have lived in Virginia since I started working for the FAA. So now we can see those colors pushing through. We're getting a real nice design pattern in there. As it cools, it's going to poke, you're going to see the colors more. Yeah, you just hang out so, now we're going to get into the hole poking here in just a minute. How long has Josh and Todd been doing glass blowing? Todd started about 21 years ago. Josh started about 14 years ago. 18 years. What's that? 18 years. 18 years. Okay. I'm losing track of time. Well, I. I I know that Todd started here in 1999, so that would be 22 years, and I started about six months after Josh. I'm up at 22 years of blowing glass, and Josh is at 18 years of blowing glass, and Foster, we figure Foster had to start as a four-year-old because he's been blowing glass over 40 years, and he doesn't look a day over 45. Okay, by heating that tungsten pick and pushing in, and you can see it does take a good bit of force. In fact, when he moves that, 
you can see Foster is really working to keep the glass down there and not have the pipe slide. He's going to get the tungsten really hot, that's why he's got the torch right there at the tip of it. And he's going to poke another hole now. So Foster, you'll see this pipe move a little bit. Josh and I did a couple of these the other day, but believe me, it's, it's tough to hold on to it. Each of these holes that he's poking will eventually be enlarged into a window. But he needs to make sure that they're established, and then he can go around and enlarge them. Yes, uh, Antoinette, I know Skids very well. Yeah, in fact, we even took a couple classes together. Say hi to him for me. Skitch is one of the few people I know that offered to arm wrestle Martin Yanuski, and uh, I would not want any part of that. Uh, Martin is uh, an internationally blown, known art uh, class artist, and that guy is some kind of strong. Okay, so here we go with more holes being poked. Again, these will all turn into windows. Yeah, Antoinette, I, I don't think he actually took him up on the arm wrestling, but they talked about it a, a fair bit. And for those of you that are enjoying watching our videos, I can also uh, yeah, recommend you that you, you might want to watch a video of Martin making some of his huge sculptures. And Yaneski is spelled starting with a J. The holes are kind of random, okay? So he doesn't have a, I mean, he's looking to see where they are on the piece, but he's choosing his spots. So you'll recall that at the center of this is white. So when we do have the windows established to look in, will be looking at a white surface. So he's probably going to have windows all the way around this so he can look through from any angle. If he had a particular design on the inside that he wanted to look at, he might apply the holes or the windows to maybe the front two-thirds of the vessel so you're looking in at a design. But yes, uh, Barbara, it is wonderful. It's amazing stuff. But the cool part is yet to come. He's got to get these opened up. And then eventually, it looks like maybe here in a moment, he'll be taking a seat at the bench and enlarging these. He'll probably shape the thing up a little bit more. I saw So what, did we melt the plastic bag? Yeah. Okay. So sometimes the frit gets really, really hot. And if we pour it back into the bag a little too soon, the frit burns a hole in the plastic and it comes out on the floor. So that's why we'll typically leave it in the bowls a little bit. Once it cools off, we'll get rid of it. Do you want this moved so you can use the marker? Yeah, okay. So Foster's reheating yeah, for him. Josh has the tweezers in hand. Now Josh will have control of the iron to turn it. We'll come over here so you can see the angle he's approaching from, and he's enlarging and rounding these holes, just as he did on the pitcher, just as he did on the vase with the tubes. Now, since this is open in the middle, there's no real resistance from the form, and of course, if he were to try to blow into it right now, it would be completely pointless, because 
the air would escape those holes. So as far as his shaping goes, it's going to be a matter of heating and then marvering or blocking to get the symmetry he'll need. What's that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Yeah, it does look like a potato. In fact, if we had a cowboy hat and a mustache, it looks like a potato. Mr. It looks like a potato. David Hogan says, and I'm thinking, okay, how about Mr. Potato Head? Let's put a, a hat and a mustache on it. There you go. Okay. So now they don't collapse the whole piece because he's very careful, and it's also very, very thick. Were it thin, it would really come together. And if he chooses to. He can actually kind of lift up as he's in each of those holes with the tweezer and keep it from falling further in. You can see now that he's enlarging them. Many of them are getting lengthened where he has two adjacent. Then he might keep one small and one large for a variety of window sizes. And by stretching along the axis or the length of the piece, He's helping with his symmetry because it's actually stretching the glass a little. He'll also be able to use the marver or his jacks or the block, whatever tool he chooses to get this more or less back to a symmetrical shape. You know, relatively symmetrical. It right. It won't, it won't ever be perfectly symmetrical at this stage, perfectly rounded, because of all the poking and prodding. There's However... The really cool part is coming up, and I'm going to give you a, a little heads up on to what to watch for. The way we get the windows to appear in this piece is to drop the whole thing into the furnace and gather over it. Now, once this is all gathered over, he won't have to be in a huge rush, but when he blows into the pipe, the air will push the glass that falls into each of those holes outward. So what we'll wind up with is a nice, smooth, continuous surface because glass will be coating, fresh hot glass will be coating all of the frit and it'll also be over top of the holes he's created. Right, and the glass isn't going to just run into it and make it solid again. Right. So he'd like to have a pretty much uniform shape on it. But it doesn't have to be completely round. Normally, if this were a regular vase, we'd have solid glass and we'd be making it round. But you can tell that the diameter across it is pretty much the same throughout. By using the back of the blades of the tweezers, he's able to push down on it. If he sees a high spot, he's able to enlarge or stretch the hole in if he wants. He's going to let it cool for just a moment before he takes his gather. You want a larger block, you're going to use paper. And this cooling process is going to keep this from getting distorted when it's exposed to the 2,000 degrees glass. Yes, it is possible to blow a bubble through the holes, root. It's perfectly possible to do that. And another day we may demonstrate something like that. Another interesting technique, but we're not doing it today, is we could create a cup out of this, putty it up, and open up the top so it's like an open cylinder. Then we could take a contrasting color of glass when it's reheated, drop it in the whole thing, and blow the new color out through the holes to have bulbs on the side of it. So the world is your oyster. But for right now, it's going to be Windows. Is this Windows 10? <laughs> okay, no. Windows 10. All right. All right. So still waiting on that to get cool enough. We don't want the heat to penetrate that and distort the shape that he has. So you can tell even based on the other pieces you've seen made here, that he waited a lot longer for that. So, we won't get in his way, but we'll get a little closer look. He 
goes in at a fairly good angle, gets in there, covers it all up, brings it out. I'll get the door. He strips it off into the bucket a little bit, and you can see where the windows are forming. Now, the glass is very hot. The iridescence makes it difficult to see. Looking at this camera, all I see is a yellow ball. Grab a door. So, in a moment, you'll start to see the windows where the glass is cooling off and it's starting to be visible. You can just see the few of them forming up at the top of the piece, what's closest to the blowpipe. And as we go along, you'll see more and more of these. Now, he still has time. He's not concerned about blowing out too much yet. That glass. Shaping this right now, a contour up and down the whole thing. And he's flattening the bottom just a little bit. And it'll probably be another heat or so before we can actually really see the bubbles. So the whole thing is now coated in clear glass. And the clear glass is just lying in those holes. He's cooling the tip now. You want paddle there? I'll do it at the bench. Okay. And the glass is starting to cool off a little bit, and we'll be able to see the windows here in just a moment. How often do you burn yourself? Well, try not to make it often at all. It does well, happen by accident. <laughs> That's really you not quite fair. Okay, so now you'll notice a big section of clear glass down at the bottom. That's going to be the foot of the vessel, and it's going to remain solid, clear glass. No, Antoinette, he has not blown into it yet. <coughs> You're starting to see the windows now, and now we'll get a little bit of air uh, via the blow hose. So using the blow hose allows the glass blower to use hand tools at the same time to blow into the glass. So now will be the first time he actually gets air into it and starts pushing the glass outward. And again, that glass did not fall into the holes and create a big thick spot on the interior. Yeah, it's a big hunk of glass. And I really think the only time I've burned Josh is we did one of these the other day, and it was from the glove. He had a glove on for manipulating the no, glass. No, you had a glove on. And I did too. No, I didn't have a glove on. That, the, oh, that was just from my glove? Yeah, I was opening okay, the Okay, so we, uh, we reached for the annealer door at the same time, and I didn't see him reaching, and my glove touched his hand. Did not burn him with hot glass or a tool. It was a glove. Okay, so now you can see the windows. You can see the thick bottom, which will be the foot. A little bit of air in it. I think he did it on really cognizant of is things are hot and avoiding getting burnt. There are slight accidents, but uh, fortunately, nothing serious. Now he's letting that stretch out. He's using gravity to elongate it, and now he'll begin to cut a jack line up by the pipe. You're starting to see the windows down. He can't stop turning to show us the glass because it's still very hot. As he turns it, you'll get sight of those windows looking into the piece. And in fact, some of them are aligned opposite one another, and you can see through the piece. Well, welcome, Jen. We're glad to have you at any time.
All right, so Jim, what we're doing here is uh, making a piece with windows in it. Josh has formed the piece, got all his color collected, and he poked holes in it to create spaces for windows. Then he gathered over it, and that glass filled the holes without going deep into the pipe. Now he's elongating it. He catches it with the paper on the end and that helps him keep it symmetrical. It's still very hot. You can see it expanding. He's using the blow hose to inflate the glass. He used the paper to position the glass and also to cool it so that it doesn't expand too much right in the middle. So the paper does a couple of things for him. The paper will cool the glass and it will also help shape the glass. probably getting pretty close to where he wants on the length of this so it's not quite as hot at the neck as it was before. He's going to reinforce his back line. Foster's using a paddle to shield his arm. And now he uses the newspaper down there to hold it. Gives him that nice large inflation at the bottom without being blown out. And now we can really see the windows form. So that clear glass did not penetrate and go in. Well, thanks for joining us today, Jennifer. And uh, yeah, pictures will be posted tomorrow, and you can finish watching this uh, portion of the video. We're going to be going to the transfer in just a moment and then opening the top or creating the top. But thanks for uh, stopping by. Foster's going to use the paddle. So this is a really cool way to keep the bottom shape. Josh is pushing the glass a little bit with the newspaper, and Foster's flat the bottom. If Josh didn't hold the newspaper there, Foster's pressure with the paddle would force it to cave in. You can see where the colors have pushed through. They don't show their true colors yet because of the heat. And you can see these marvelous windows looking all the way through the glass. Walker's going to make a pretty good sized punny this time because this is going to be a heavy little guy. Foster's getting them the putty shape, just a little bit of glass off the end. We need a larger contact point on this uh, putty than we do on normal pieces because it's a lot of weight on there. So by having just a little bit larger diameter putty than we'd say see on a normal vase or bowl, we got a good contact point. You'll have a solid connection. and it'll hold the piece just perfectly. Josh is letting things cool off a little bit. Uh, Alyssa, that's fine. Join us anytime. Come back and uh, watch the whole video later. There'll be pictures of the annealed pieces online. Notice how he's pushing in a little bit. Now he pulls it out. He wants a nice curved shape down there on the body. He doesn't want, he wants just enough contact that will hold until he's ready to break it free at the very end. Yeah, an ornament with windows. I want to see the hook he puts on this. Okay, a little bit of water on the neck. And he'll probably bring this up on the rail to break it off because it's going to be heavy. Foster gets it off of there. And we've got another successful transfer. Now we're going to start heating the lip area. You can see the windows in there. Pick up some glass. Yeah, some glass. Okay. 
again, the lip of the vessel was cold enough to fracture and break apart. We've got to reheat it for a little while just to get it hot enough to work again. That's why he's got most of the piece out. And even from here, it's kind of an interesting view. You can see the bright light of the quarry hole going down through the piece and coming out the windows. You'll also notice that every once in a while he puts the whole piece into the glory hole. That's to keep all of it warm, okay? We want to keep the glass well above a thousand degrees so that it doesn't start cracking. And that's why you'll see Josh pushing the entire piece in for a flash heat. And then once he gets that lip hot, he'll bring it back to the bench. You'll also notice that when he brings that back to the bench, the lip and probably the top two inches of the vessel will be a lot brighter color than the rest of it. Even though the rest of it is probably 11 to 1200 degrees, it won't glow like the end of it. Here we go. There's that huge orange glow out in the upper quarter of the vessel. He's got the jacks on. Foster uses the paddle to flatten a little bit. Now he's got the parchopies, the wooden jacks, to kind of open things up a little more. And here's a shot from the inside. Okay. You all right? Get that heated up. Probably approach it once more with the partial. Was that about five, six pounds? Yeah, like five. Yeah. Five pounds. Now the the perception of the weight is accentuated by the fact that it's on the end of the blowing iron. And it's at the far end, it's about four feet away from Josh. So that makes it actually feel a lot heavier. Let's look inside see the windows and through. Again, the colors are not showing true exactly because of the heat. That will show up. You'll see the video or the posting tomorrow of the finished piece. Josh is going to take one final flash. Foster's got the insulated gloves, and in just a moment as he lets this sit, make sure that it's not too hot, Josh will put a little bit of water onto the punty joint to the piece, tap it, and knock it off. Foster catches it. And into the annealer it goes. Yeah, that's it. There's some hearts flowing. Let's hear it for Josh and Foster. Nice job, guys. Absolutely wonderful. That's not spoken for, is it? No, that's not. No, if any of you want that, contact us. Uh, that's a new it's, set of it's, pieces we're doing, so. Yep. Wonder. Okay, so let's uh, do a quick recap. Before we get down there, I'll show you. This is our latest thing. It's going to be Cats for Kids. So hang with us just a moment, folks. So back in November, 
We did demonstrations and we raised money for No Kid Hungry. All right, and a lot of you bought drinking glasses then. This time around, we're doing caps for kids and it's gonna be this special design that Todd has come up with. And these are what we call Maryland colors because of the studio association with Maryland. It's a limited edition. They'll be signed and numbered. They're $60 each. That'll include shipping in the U.S. Uh, international would be a little more, but you can contact us about that. And they'll only be done in the month of March. We're going to limit the production on this. So if you'd like to help out a really worthwhile charity, this is what we'd like you to join in on. Right here is the marble with Iceland 1. And that was from last week's drawing. This week, by commenting, you're going to be in the possibility of being running for this beautiful cranberry pink ornament. And our theme today was holes and windows. So we started off with the gazing ball. Todd did that. Uh, that doesn't have holes poked at it, but the windows are created through the process of using the diamond mold. We showed you how we poke holes in the glass. We can do something simple. It's a donut shape. We can put that donut onto the stem of a vase. We could even put a whole series of holes up and down a vessel. And we can put hole right into one to make a picture out of it. We also have a really unique technique. I'm not going to try to describe it right now. Just go back in the video and look this up because that is a really cool piece. And then this is what you just saw, except instead of blue, it has green windows. The top's a little bit different, but hey, that's part of the creative process. So thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you next week at the Art of Fire. Bye-bye.